Which Side Podcast is a proud member of the Which Side Media Collective. This is episode 68. Yeah, we have Michael C. Dorf on. He's a law professor at Cornell, vegan. He has a blog called Dorf on Law. And he's a constitutional lawyer. So I uh, hope you guys enjoy. So what events do you got going on? So we have the Utah Supreme Court hearing. It's Living Rivers versus U.S. Oil Sands. And that's going to be at 450 South State Street. And it's open to the public Tuesday, March 4th at 9 a.m. Be sure to be there to support. Uh, I know Honey LeBronx is doing some karaoke thing. Look that shit up. It's on Monday. Yeah. Drag karaoke. Um, February 24th, 1848. Began the French Revolution, which inspired revolt all across Europe. And... Uh, What's uh, how's that doing today? Hmm? How's that going today? God, there's more revolts happening right now. Yeah, it's crazy. It is crazy. What's going on? In there. It definitely is. That the media doesn't cover for some reason. They and they cover it really weird when they do. Yeah, you know, like uh, especially if there's stuff in Ukraine. Like if you dig, you can find news. But like the main news yeah. stories are like, oh, U.S. says, you know, we don't like what they're doing. Or well, like 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 I was saying already is that. Today I, I got a, a, a news bulletin update. I get them on my phone. And it just said that the Ukraine's parliament voted unanimously Saturday to remove the president. That's after, like, that doesn't say fled the, the capital city. And that's after. It's not talking about sniping the protesters. Yeah, it's not talking about anything. It's just like, oh, they just unanimously voted to kick him out. Hey, guys, enjoy this one. Hello? Hi. Hi, Michael. I'm Jeremy. Hi. Nice to meet you uh, through Skype, as it was. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I'm Jordan. Hi, Jordan. How's it going? So you were saying you had to take a, a dog to a vet. Yeah. So my uh, we have three dogs that you know we got from various uh, rescue outfits, and including a now uh, eight-month-old, uh, I'm not sure what he is, Australian something or other, um, and uh, yeah, we, he just had a. He's been he's been peeing in the house a lot lately, which we attributed to a medical issue rather than a psychiatric issue uh, or an anger issue. So I took him to the vet, and we think he has a UTI. So if if I have to interrupt, it's just to get the vet's phone call to uh, see what the test results are. So I apologize not, for not that. No worry. So you have, you have three three pets. Yeah, three uh, three companion animals, all um, crazy in their own way. Each one had an interesting start. Uh, Shana, who is our oldest, was uh, living on the streets in New York City till she was about one, and she was uh, taken in by the you know New York City shelter system, which is not great. Um, and I think they actually branded her unadoptable. Uh, but Bidewee, which is a no-kill uh, nonprofit, took her, and then we found her there and adopted her. And then uh, Cody came from a similar situation in Georgia, although I don't think anybody ever treated him as unadoptable. Uh, he's, uh, he's about six and then blue, who's the, the one with the, the peeing problem, uh, we got from a woman who does, a runs her own rescue operation, uh, roughly halfway between here, which is Ithaca and Buffalo. Oh, nice. Oh, we actually know somebody who yeah. does pit bull rescue in New York. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Matt oh, that's great. Yeah. We, uh, we, I don't know if you know, um, Kathy Fox, who runs a great, uh, vegan, um, store they do like vegan cosmetics uh, uh, in Scranton, Pennsylvania. Uh, she rescued a bunch of pit bulls who are very sweet. They're really so loving my, dogs. My kid, yeah, my kids love love her, her and her shop and her dogs and her daughter. And so whenever we drive to New York City, which we do with some frequency, we try to stop in Scranton and see her, her and her dogs. Just, just out of curiosity, why would they uh, mark the the animal as unadoptable? Um, well, you know, a lot of the the shelters believe that 
they don't have the room for all of the dogs and cats they take in. And partly it's because they don't do enough outreach and who knows whether, you know, how much of that is true. But uh, my understanding is that they have someone evaluate them and uh, their view is that they're going to, you know, they're going to have to euthanize uh, something like 90% of the dogs they take in. And so they, uh, you know, they kind of triage. Uh, and then what these other outfits do basically is to go through the public shelters and take the dogs into, into their shelters. Uh, we're lucky uh, here in, in Ithaca, Tompkins County is one of the first and still only no-kill public uh, SPCAs in the country. Uh, so, you know, they, they do a lot of outreach, um, which I think is, you know, has been shown that can work. Um, if yeah. you know, if you really work with the community, it really does. Our local uh, public one is almost completely no kill now. They're pushing really hard to get that 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 point. Right now, um, they only have to put down cats. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. It's... I mean, it's uh, yeah. They they uh, my both of my daughters have volunteered at our our SPCA, and uh, you know, it, it, I think it helps a lot that they're they're no kill shelters. So, are your daughters vegan as well? They are. Uh, Mina, who is, Mina is 12 and Amelia is nine and they are both, uh, pretty committed vegans. Um, they, uh, my wife Sherry and I became vegan, uh, I guess it was about eight years ago now. And, uh, so Amelia doesn't really remember a time when she wasn't vegan, but Mina does. Um, and, uh, you know, I think there was at least a, uh, she was a vegetarian when we, when we at that point. But when we switched over to vegan, there was at first a little bit of resistance and some backsliding on her part. But uh, now they're both, you know, they're out and proud. Um, Mina actually, uh, for her uh, term papers in school the last couple of years, has uh, chosen topics that enabled her to sort of uh, make her uh, political points, even though the teachers apparently weren't, you know, thrilled with that. But, but she did it. <laughs> she did it. She did a paper on uh, polar bears a couple of years ago. And, you know, so it's like, what are, what are the polar bears' habitat? What do they eat? What do they do? And then, of course, at the end, she's talking about the, uh, you know, the destruction of polar bear habitat due to uh, global warming. And, and then she uh, cites, uh, you know, both the UN report and some other studies uh, showing that actually this is, you know, basically, uh, you, know, you know, a big chunk of that is due to, uh, animal agriculture. So she had, she concluded her report by, so if you like polar bears and want them to continue living in the wild, you should go vegan. <laughs> that, that it's really funny because my daughter last week did the same thing in first grade. She They were doing um, a report on just general pollution and she cited the UN as well as saying, you know, that animal agriculture is the, the biggest cause of pollution. And, you know, if you really care about pollution levels, you should uh, stop eating animals and consuming their flesh. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's, uh, you know, and um, I, I, I don't know how effective I've been as an advocate, but my kids are, are, are great. I mean, they've got, uh, each of them has um, friends who have become vegan, um, I think, because of their, their example. So I'm, I'm, I'm very proud of what they've been able to do. So what brought you and your wife to veganism? Like, what, what made that pinnacle change for you? Sure. So, um you know, like most people, I think we had gone around um, without really thinking about our actions and our commitments. So we'd both been animal lovers. We said all along, but we, you know, we ate and wore, and wore clothes the way everybody else in this society does. Uh, I, I think I have to, you know, say that, you know, 99% of the credit for turning us goes to uh, Gary Francione, who was uh, Sherry's colleague for many years at uh, Rutgers Newark Law School. And we were aware of his work. And, um, you know, basically, uh, uh, you know, it, it was there as an example. And at some point, we sort of realized, well, I guess he's right. You know, we just sort of read, read some of his stuff. But it took a long time, actually, before we then made the change. You know, so I, I think it's a it's a testament to the um, ability of human beings to know what's right and still do something else that it took us as long as it did. Um, I, I came across some study not all that long ago about uh, philosophers. And so it said like professional philosophers um, are more, much more likely than the general public to uh, credit 
the argument that it's uh, wrong to harm animals for food and entertainment and clothing and so forth, but that they're no more likely actually to uh, behave any differently. And so I think we were sort of just, you know, intellectualizing in the way that the philosophers were for a long time. Uh, and then Sherry credits, um, uh, she tells a story, which I think, which is true, which is, I'm not sure it, it had as much of an effect on me as it did on her, except that, you know, when you live with somebody, you, you, you tend to move in tandem. So this was uh, almost 20 years now, we were spending a couple of weeks in the Netherlands uh, during the summer, and the path we took uh, to and from, um, I don't remember whether it was uh, where I was working or whatever, whatever we were doing, we passed by this little goat farm every day. And, uh, you know, as, as farms go, this was a pretty nice one, right? It wasn't a, a concentrated, uh, you know, factory farm sort of place. Um, but, uh, and, and we didn't really think what happened to the goats, but we just noticed how friendly the goats were and they would come up and wanted to be pet just like dogs. And so, uh, we sort of went vegetarian very shortly after that. And then it took us about another, uh, you know, close to a decade to become vegan. Was there a defining moment that made you be like, okay, now, now we have to make that next step? Or was it just that gradual process of the acceptance? Yeah, so I think it was just a gradual process. As I say, I, I sort of knew it was something I had to do um, before I did it. Um, and um, I guess for me, the, the crucial thing was that a friend of mine who... Um, uh, had been sort of on the same journey, but started a little later, announced to us one night that he's gone vegan. And so very shortly after that, I just sort of thought, well, if Paul can do it, I can do it. Um, and uh, I, I wouldn't say it was a competitive urge uh, so much as it, you know, was a kind of, you know, social realization. I, I think one of the things I've learned um, being part of the animal rights movement is how important social structures are to people changing the way they live, right? So you can, you can tell people as much as you want that uh, it's not necessary to eat animal products or to wear animal products, but telling them is going to have much less of an impact than showing them. And so if you're, uh, you know, I think it's no accident that a lot of my close friends now are vegan. Some that I've become friends with since learning that uh, they were vegan because it was a, uh, you know, they're part of the community, but also that, that people sort of see what's possible by looking around them. You know, I, I can't completely agree more like with the social aspect, um, as an activist for a, a long time and with animal rights, you kind of just mold all of your friends as other activists and it really can discourage, you know, showing people that, you know, everyone can really do that. And it's not just this fringe identity. It's only been the last couple, probably 10 years that I've really been, you know, forcing myself to step outside that and make friends that, you know, aren't already part of art of the animal rights community. Um, and, you know, and, and you can bring them up that way and show them and, and expand, you know, the message even broader. Yeah, no, I think, I mean, I think that both kinds of interactions are really important for activists. You want to have a group of uh, friends and colleagues with whom you feel comfortable just being yourself mm -hmm. and and even expressing frustration with people who don't get it or who react in a way that's dismissive and so forth, a, a place where you can go to sort of uh, uh, unwind and recharge. Um, but then, right, you don't want to just be talking uh, to people who already agree with you. You want to get out there in, in the world a little bit. Uh, one of the things that... Um, my that uh, we learned from um, uh, Ray Sakura a number of years ago it was just something she sort of said, uh, which it may be in her. She 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 and uh, J C uh, Jim Carker and her husband have a, a nice little book called Plant Peace Daily. Uh, it may actually be in the book, but I remember her saying it was you know there are little things you can do like if you're going to be traveling wear a t-shirt with a message on it. Uh, and that way, even if you're you're shy and you don't want to approach people, well, people will see it, and you know that that itself might do something, or they might come up to you and start a conversation. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I've um, I've been in situations where I've been in a grocery store and see somebody with a with like a radical T-shirt of some sort, like Mick Cruelty or something like that, and you go up and you stri you strike a conversation with them, and it's definitely a way to be socially interactive if you're shy. I could see that. 
Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and um, I had, we had an experience doing this it was at a, at an airport and um, there was a security guard or he might've been, you know, one of the Homeland security people who was, it's hard. I don't remember what, what exactly his status was, but he, he was, he's checking the bags and he, and he sees the shirt, which I, I think Sherry was wearing. And he says, Oh yeah, my wife's trying that. Um, <laughs> and so that, that, that was an entree to a whole conversation. Cause you know, plane was like two hours late or something. So they had, you had the time to talk. Yeah. One of my, one of my favorite interactions like that was at an airport. Um, I was just wearing, you know, a standard vegan t-shirt. Um, and this lady started talking to me. She's like, Oh, I've been vegetarian. I've always wanted to go vegan. How hard is it? My, my biggest thing is just, you know, I don't know what kind of snacks I could get. So, you know, I pull out my bag and give oh, her some, some vegan snacks. Yeah. Uh, I gave her some like some vegan beef jerky that she didn't know even existed. Um, you just get, to, it's an opener to create like great dialogue with people. Yeah, no, that's great. Food is a is a huge uh, entree. I think the um, the undergraduate organization here at Cornell, which is great. For, for one thing, they're called the Cornell Vegan Society, which I I love the fact that vegan is part of their name. Um, but you know, one of the things that they do a lot is they'll just sort of table with free food. And you know, college students are always looking to eat, and it's they they you know they always make it delicious. And so that, that helps, that helps a great deal. Um, on, uh, this past week, um, uh, Sherry teaches an animal rights class. And so for one of the classes, she thought she'd just sort of like, you know, um, uh, do a food demo. So we had a friend of ours, uh, who's a vegan chef come and she did most of the cooking and I, and I made smoothies. Um, and they, the, the students sort of know me, uh, in a different context. So if they're seeing like, you know, a sort of nerdy professor uh, who they don't think of as like an alternative food cook can actually, you know, make a really delicious, uh, healthy vegan smoothie in five minutes, uh, it sort of demonstrates some possibilities. So was there any challenges like for, for going vegan, um, either like personally or uh, career wise? Um, well, that's a really interesting question. Um, so uh, I. The short answer is not great challenges. I mean, I think for me, the hardest thing um, was, um, I mean, they're, they're, they're always sort of friends and family challenges, right? People that are used to just, you know, having you over and now it's awkward and so forth. And I, I don't think I have any sort of unique story in that way. But the, the hardest thing for me was actually um, watching my mother's health situation. So my mom died this past October, um, you know, in the end from a, a cardiac event, but she'd been unwell for like 20 years. Uh, and, uh, you know, it was, a, it was a constellation of uh, sort of puzzling symptoms, some physical, some neurological, some psychiatric. Uh, the doctors never quite figured out what it was. Um, but I had a, a suspicion that it was uh, at least potentially diet related because it all began with what she thought were food allergies and uh, all sorts of issues. And, uh, you know, towards the end of her life, um, she sort of expressed interest in going vegan, uh, and, but, but never really got there. And so it was very hard for me to see, you know, to see her deteriorate and then to, to die, knowing that. Uh, that it was at least possible that if um, we had really seriously changed the way she ate, she might have uh, gotten better, um, or at least not have deteriorated the way that that she did. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure a lot, you know, virtually everybody has family members uh, in that situation. Um, professionally, it's actually been really great um, in that when uh, when Sherry and I got to Cornell Law School. Um, you know, people were, were accommodating, but now it's gotten to the point where there we've, you know, a few other additional colleagues and staff have gone vegan. And so now at, at any event at which they serve food, um, it's not just like, like, well, there's, here's a vegan plate on the side. It's like half of the options are like distinctly vegan options. Uh, so I, so I think that that's at least exposed a lot of people to, uh, that possibility. Um, and, uh, you know, I haven't really had problems professionally. Uh, you know, uh, Sherry writes more in this area. I, I'm basically a, just a guy who writes about constitutional law and law and social movements and stuff. And, and occasionally I'll write something about animal rights issues. 
Um, but in a way that I think that gives that gives me some somewhat uh, greater credibility. Uh, uh, I was talking to a um, uh, uh, Ann Dinshaw the other day. I don't know if you know <laughs> Ann. Uh, if, you're, if you're hearing barking in the background, I apologize. The dogs probably have noticed somebody walking <laughs> oh, down no the worries. street. Anyway, so I was, I was talking to Ann yesterday, and, and Ann, Ann is now um, doing a lot of the work for the American Vegan Society. So she said she, she was uh, adding me to the Speaker's Bureau, and she said that you know she, one of the reasons she wanted to have me on, on the Bureau is that I, I don't look like a vegan. Um, by which she doesn't mean like I'm overweight because because I'm not, but but I, I know what she means. What she means is I don't have tats and dreads. I'm you know a guy wearing a, 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 a not usually a suit and tie, but I, but I look like I look like a, a guy who goes to an office uh, to work, and that and that you know it, it's um it, it, part of it, 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 it it's kind of similar to when um the the world started noticing that. Um, not everybody who was gay was dressed like they were, you know, in a uh, gay pride parade, although, of course, that's fine, but that, you know, it was people from all walks of life. So I, I think that's a, that's a big help for being a vegan ambassador is to have people who are, you know, uh, just like everybody else's neighbors. Yeah, I've actually tried really hard to maintain a, a more conservative appearance um, just because of that reason, you know. Um, right, right. Yeah, you you can you, you, the 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 more conservatively you you appear, the more radical the things you can you can say are. <laughs> it's really true, you know. And like, I, I can't deny I have tattoos, but you would never know it unless you like went swimming with me or something. <laughs> you know, um, I keep them very hidden and and professional because you know I do wear a tie every day usually. <laughs> so yeah, yeah it, it's it's quite amazing, um, and especially when people actually find out, they're like, "What? You, but you're normal." <laughs> right, right. Yeah, I love it. And I guess I'm on I'm on the other end where I have stretched ears and all sorts of other things, and so people just automatically assume if I tell them. <laughs> yeah, although you know there are so many people who are um, uh, countercultural in their lifestyle and whose politics are are quite radical, but you know just don't see this as one of their issues, um, or or what I find even uh, worse, see this as somehow uh, antagonistic to their worldview, right? That they'll see um, the, the, you know, wanting to lead a compassionate life with respect to animals is somehow inconsistent with wanting to be uh, compassionate towards and, you know, uh, toward, towards their fellow humans. Um, as I, it was one of the reasons why I really like the um, the sorts of organizations that uh, combine an animal rights and a human rights focus, like there's this um, there's a uh, charitable organization called a Well Fed World that uh, that's sort of the vegan alternative to Heifer. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's it's a way of uh, of um, you know really helping people in developing countries um, uh, have sustainable agriculture without um harming animals and and the the planet um another really good the, one is the, the food empowerment project yeah i was going to say that yeah. one yeah yeah uh and then there are there are even ones that are um that you don't think of in this way uh there is a um uh there's a group that a, a colleague of mine who's not a vegan and not really sympathetic to it uh but but she's there's an organization called feed my starving children which is a, a christian org uh, organization um and they provide, but the meals that they provide are in fact vegan. So we've um, we hmm. we've done um, food packing events with uh, them um, and brought our kids and so forth. And it's uh, you know it's it's nice that that you can find you can find these areas of commonality. Do they do the vegan meals because of nutritional density or, or cost, not because of um, ideology? So it's 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 certainly not because of animal rights or ideology. It's it's the, the two things you said. Plus, um, wanting to have meals that are available for people in all cultures, right? So if they were, if they were providing food that had animal products, um, they might not know that it's halal if they're doing it in areas where okay. uh, they've got Muslim clients, or um, if they're going to be doing it in uh, their vegetarian culture. So they, so their their view is it's a kind of lowest common denominator. Um, but it all, but you know, it also turns out that it's vegan, and I think that's not an accident. That's awesome. I that's, that's I, I never even thought about it that way. 
And it's great to see like a Christian organization stepping outside of their, their boundaries and accepting other faiths, uh, morals. Yeah, no, they're, they're, uh, I mean, I've, I've, you know, gone to some of their events and I, I, you know, I have great respect for the, for the work that they do. Um, and as I said, they don't, they don't advertise that it's vegan, but it, and it's, it's almost, it's almost accidentally vegan, but you know, I'll take it. <laughs> yeah. I, that's almost the best kind of veganism for me sometimes. Cause you know, it kind of proves that it's not hard. <laughs> Right, right. That's a nice, what nice point. So, how how has it been like um, suddenly being aligned with even more radical elements of society? Because um, you know, you, you go to veganisms and you go to animal rights activists, which are the number one terrorist threat in the United States. Like, have, has that ever been brought up, and how have you dealt with it? So it's. Uh, I'll tell you. A, so the short answer is um, not in any way that's affected me personally, but it. Um, I. Uh, a number of years ago, I there's a there's a guy I, I've I've co-taught with and I uh, wrote a uh, an art, a law of social movements article with, uh, mostly about um, uh, LGBT rights, but I told him that I was working on a book on um, abortion and animal rights, which Sherry and I are, are working on that book, and I'm, I'm actually right now writing uh, a chapter on um, the 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 role of violence in the animal rights movement and in the pro-life movement. Um, but when I told him I was right, but I didn't, I didn't say any of that to, to, the, to this guy. I said, I mentioned that I was, we were working on this book and he immediately, the, the association he came up with immediately was, um, uh, violence. All right. So even, you know, um, and you know, I, so I pointed out that actually that's not a big part of the movement. And even within, you know, even the, the, you know, I'm not, uh, I don't agree with it, but it, but even within the, the parts of the movement that do that, it's not you know you know it it they they mostly aim to do property damage and to to do these releases. They're not for the most part uh, you know uh, going trying trying to harm people. Um, so uh, there is there is definitely that that image out there. Um, I I was at a I was at a conference at UCLA, um, I guess it was about uh, almost two years ago now. I think it was last year. Well, anyway, uh, um, on um, animal rights and uh, it was an animal rights conference in general, but I was on a panel on animal rights and the First Amendment. Um, and uh, you know, one of the things that that some one of the other people on the panel who was not a vegan, not part of the movement at all, did recognize was how grossly disproportionate the government's response to the animal rights movement has been relative to uh, real threats. Right? So he, you know, he recognized that the, the insanity of uh, treating um, animal rights and eco-terrorism as a threat comparable to, certainly to, you know, um, uh, uh, jihadist terrorism, but even uh, to uh, right-wing uh, uh, militia-type terrorism and so forth. Uh, so I, I think there's both um, a uh, a sense of people who haven't studied it closely that um, uh, you know Alf and uh, uh, the uh, the sort of more uh, radical elements aligned with Shack are sort of at the core of the movement. Uh, and then people who are not part of the movement but have looked at it realize that that's actually not uh, the not the, the the core of of this movement. I seem to have left you in stunned silence. So, yeah, no, I was uh, you know I I was formulating like five questions at once based on that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um so studying the different social movements, what can us animal rights activists take from other movements that we aren't currently doing? Like what kind of advice would you give yeah, to people so, organizing so today? A, right. That's a great question. Um, you know, one of the things I think you, you, uh, I mean, I, I'm, I'm a lawyer and a constitutional lawyer. And I think that there's, uh, you know, my sense of looking at the big picture is that, uh, the law is a very limited tool for uh, social change. Um, a, a more pessimistic way to put this, we say that the, 
the law is at best a reactive um, and at worst a conservative or even reactionary institution, um, that it tends to reflect uh, the interests of people who are powerful and the status quo. Um, there are ways in which one can use the law opportunistically to bring about social change, but that you know, if you if you look at something like the the enormous success of the uh, LGBTQ movement uh, in recent years in the courts and in state legislatures and so forth, and still obviously they have a long way to go, um, but but you know, sort of winning on marriage and other issues, right? Um, that's not because uh, legal elites are out in the vanguard. It's because the legal elites have sort of realized where uh, where the handwriting on the wall is. Um, so I, I guess I think that um, you know where where our movement is right now. I think it would be you know it would be premature to expect to get much out of the law. Uh, so, you know, there was, there was this great debate at the Animal Rights Conference um, last year between um, Bruce Friedrich, uh, formerly of PETA, now at Farm Sanctuary, uh, and Gary Francione um, about the, the role of um, uh, animal welfare law in bringing about, which is Friedrich's view, or uh, impeding um, real change, which is Francione's view. Um, and, you know, I'm not sure I, I know who's right in that debate. I mean, I have res a great respect for both of them. Um, but I think that, uh, it's interesting that what Friedrich doesn't say is that the law is the way you're going to really, um, change things on its own. That is for, even for him, you bring about legal change as a means of social organization, as a means of uh, changing people's minds, not because you're going to pass a law and it's like waving a magic wand and all of a sudden things things get better. Uh, but there is there is a um, a fairly robust social movements literature about how legal activists work continuous continuously with uh, social activists and movement activists, and so that sometimes you lose. A uh, case, or you don't get legislation enacted, but you end up winning by losing because you've organized, you've raised consciousness, and in the long run, uh, that's what really matters. So, so being a constitutional lawyer, what would be um, your view on grand juries and and how they're being used against activists right now? Uh, yeah. So you know the, uh, I mean, I, I think the 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 problem with a grand jury. So here's a speciesist expression that was famously uttered by a, a well-known judge. He said, "You know, a, a competent prosecutor can get a, a grand jury to indict a ham sandwich, uh, and you know, of course, a ham sandwich ought to be indicted, but not for the reason that, that he had in mind." <laughs> uh, so, so um, the the grand jury is an inherently uh, oppressive tool. Um, it's it, it's weirdly, it's in the Constitution as though it's a protection for for citizens. It's not. It's a it's a tool of prosecutors, um, and, which is why savvy defense attorneys often will uh, urge their clients to waive grand jury indictment. Um, so there, so that's that's number one. Number two, I mean, I guess I think the real problem is not so much the the tactics as it is the law um, that you know. I, I just by coincidence, I for for this other uh, this other project I'm working on, I, I read the uh, U.S. Court of Appeals uh, for the Third Circuit decision in the Shack Seven case yesterday, um, and you know that that decision is it's not that far wrong as an interpretation of the current law. Um, I think there are there are First Amendment issues there. That is that I think that some of those people were punished simply for speech. In other cases, even if there was enough evidence to support a conviction, um, the sentences were disproportionate. And beyond that, the law is uh, first is problematic under the First Amendment because it targets a particular kind of activism. Right? It's not 
a law that uh, the, the Animal Enterprise Terrorism Act doesn't doesn't say, you know, terrorism broadly defined is uh, going to be targeted. It says animal enterprise terrorism, which it defines in this incredibly broad way. Uh, so I, I think once you have that in place and you have this perception that, well, there is really, you know, animal activists are, are, are crazy, they're, they're terrorists, right? It's not surprising that grand juries are going to be used to really uh, go after people for freedom of speech, for um, uh, other uh, other issues. Uh, so here, here's another example that's just sort of at the intersection of uh, the, the pro-life movement. I, I should say I'm not part of the pro-life movement. I'm actually pro-choice, but I but I, I think that they've faced some of the same issues in terms of uh, organizing. There was a there was an oral argument before the Supreme Court uh, a couple of months ago in a case uh, that poses a challenge to. Um, buffer zones in Massachusetts around um, uh, abortion clinic uh, entrances. And during the course of the oral argument, uh, Justice Elena Kagan, who's generally a pretty liberal justice, but, but you know, not, not at all conscious on, on animal issues, um, you know, basically makes the argument that, well, of course you can do this, right? You could do this to keep um, animal rights activists back. Uh, you know, that, that was for her the kind of reductio ad absurdum of the plaintiff's position, right, which is, well, you're going to allow those crazies to, to, come, to come forward. So, so I guess I think that as a, you know, that the, the challenge is, is re here as everywhere is reaching the general public on, our, on the, the core of our message. And then after that, the, the other things will follow. I've been taught it was a very long answer. Let me just say one other thing. I mean, to, to me, the biggest constitution, sort of the biggest problem constitutionally uh, that poses a threat to animal activism are things like ag gag laws, uh, which which you know really exist solely for the purpose of uh, muzzling the you know of of, of of making it hard for for activists to to get the truth out. So I, I wanted to take a step back for a second and um, just clarify that with like the animal liber liberation front, they they do take all uh, necessary precautions against harming animal non and non human animals. Um, mm -hmm. And so, myself personally, um, I've been indicted by a grand jury for an incident incident regarding uh, the Animal Enterprise Terrorism Act. And they ended up uh, giving me ten months in prison for that. And uh, yet, yeah, you you were sentenced on criminal contempt, criminal contempt for refusing to testify. And then they jury. later they well they they charged me civilly. Then they later charged me um, criminally. criminally for the same act of recalcitrant. But um, that's like the only the third time in the United States history that they've they've done that for an individual. Um, yeah, no, I mean that that's part of the incredible overreaction. Um and uh you know, so I uh I I hear you. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, um right. Um uh, is there is there a constitutional I, basis to argue against testifying in a grand jury um where you you feel that it's just a means of a witch hunt? Um instead of just, you know, being stripped of your your rights and then if you refuse to testify being you know uh forced into into jail basically so so you can refuse to testify on the grounds that you you might incriminate yourself mm -hmm. but there's right the um you know if, if you think if you think about right uh the house on american activities uh committee right under under the mccarthy mm -hmm. right what um the they were going after people successfully for uh, refusing to name names, right? That is, um, uh, people who took who took the fifth weren't prosecuted for um, taking the fifth for them from themselves. Um, you know, I mean, mostly what happened to those people was that there was also a collateral damage because they were blacklisted in various ways. But the the as a matter of the way the Fifth Amendment has been interpreted, right? You don't have a constitutional right to refuse to sort of rat out your friends and uh comrades um what uh and um you know that's that's probably uh 
the the right interpretation of the literal words of the Fifth Amendment, but you might think that there's there's arguably a First Amendment right in the background that ought to be uh, applicable. But you know, I mean, if you're asking me as a constitutional lawyer, what you know, what's the law here? I think the law is that uh, they can, which isn't to say they should, but they can jail you for you know not giving them information about others. Yeah. Do Do you know much about um, the the sui generis um, like legal restrictions? Uh, uh, well, I mean, I know what the term sui generis means, but you're talking about <laughs> like um, so like like Jordan here, he was convicted uh, uh, under sui generis because it wasn't a felony or a misdemeanor, mm -hmm. um, and no one, including the judge that sentenced him, said they had any <laughs> idea the legal ramifications that would have on his future. Like they didn't know if it would be considered a felony or not. Um, well, I don't know if you know. Yeah, because it's not technically a felony, but yeah. he didn't know if you'd be able to vote or have a gun or or anything like I mean, that because. because it because it was a contempt proceeding, you're saying? Yeah. 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 Well, so, you know, the, the constitutional rule is supposed to be that anything for which a, a sentence of a year or longer is possible is treated as a felony. But, but that can be, you know, that's just for a bunch of purposes, like whether you get a jury trial and other things. And, you know, um, yeah, I, I mean, the short, as you can tell from my stumbling here, uh, I'm going I'm to fall back and say this isn't really my area. Um, uh, you know, sometime in the 1960s, uh, the constitutional law course split off from the constitutional criminal procedure course. Uh, so uh, I don't teach this stuff. Um, I do think that uh, it's it's very peculiar that they could charge you with something and not know whether it's a misdemeanor or a felony. Yeah, they actually uh, in the court documents they they listed next to it that it's a it's a crime of sui generis. It's neither a, mil a misdemeanor nor a felony, and the judge themselves stated that they have no idea what that means. <laughs> yeah, that's that's really scary. Yeah, uh, I mean, probably not as scary as the actual ten months in prison were, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or the grand jury proceeding itself. I, I'd say pretty intimidating, but yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, as I say, part of it is this overreaction to the animal rights movement. Part of it is just overcriminalization. I am, um, I'm now working on a case in which I represent a, um, a, a protester who was arrested as part of a protest at Hancock Air Air Base, which is uh, near Syracuse. Uh, he's a pacifist um, who participated in uh, a protest. So they've got they they do a bunch of the drone warfare from there. And so um, he and a bunch of his fellow protesters um, had a permit for their protest. Uh, and then there was a, a piece of yellow tape marking where they had to be for the protest. And as part of an act of, you know, sort of further symbolic resistance, he took one step over the tape deliberately, you know, aware that that yeah. would subject him to arrest. He got arrested. And I don't represent him for this part of it. But the, the prosecutor then uh, offered to give him a plea in which he would have to serve a year in prison. That was the plea offer, wow. oh. right? To, to put someone in prison for a year for for stepping over a piece of tape as, a, as an act of civil disobedience. Uh, this is a, right. So, um, you know, so there is a, a um, you know, the, the animal rights movement is not uniquely subject to uh, overreaction to political protest. Was he just charged with trespassing? Was that the charge for stepping over the line? He was charged with um, uh, obstruction of a public way um, and, um, you know, a couple of other uh, offenses that, that uh, you know, carry potentially long sentences. He was also subject to a, uh, a, a civil order. This is the part with respect to which I represent him, that... Uh, ordered him to to stay away from the base commander um, under a statute that was basically designed to protect um, you know battered women from their batterers, uh, as though this uh, seventy two year old pacifist was a threat to the commander of the base. Um, so he and and these uh, and the others were were subject to this this order. Uh, so that so that's a sort of ongoing controversy in our in our area. It sounds like very similar to what they did um, 
in LA with uh, vivisectionists where they put a, a basic order in saying all animal rights activists have to stay away from vivisectionists, period. Like Kate gave them all a yeah. restraining order. Yeah. I mean, that's even more, I think, overly broad. Um, but, but yeah, it's the, um, you know, there's, uh, I, I think there are, there are people, people have some reasonable fears about all sorts of things, but then, you know, once they get into their heads that, well, we sh you know, you can have your protests, but it's gotta be, you know, exactly the way we want it. Uh, they go a little nuts. I mean, this was, uh, you know, New York City during both the Giuliani and Bloomberg administrations were good examples of this, where, you know, any kind of protest activity was, um, it didn't just have to get a permit. You know, people had to be in these pens, um, and if, you, if people got arrested for stepping outside of it. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the, tr the protest tradition in this country is um, a kind of wide open protest. And um, where we've come to is a place where um, uh, people want it to be completely civilized. And, and, you know, and as I said, as a kind of academic nerd, I, I, that's my kind of a protest is, to be, is for it to be, you know, uh, people writing op-eds. But, but that's not <laughs> the whole of First Amendment activity. So, so what's been like the craziest overreach of government you've seen as far as the Constitution goes? Uh, well, you know, so uh, wow, that's a that's a hard question. It's <laughs> I, I, I've I've been teaching constitutional law since uh, 1992, and um, one of the things that that I I've noticed is it's always a good time to be teaching constitutional law because there's always something insane going on. Um, <laughs> So, uh, you know, during the 90s, there was the, the Clinton impeachment and all of the things that that led to. Uh, then at the beginning of the, the current century, right, we had Bush v. Gore. Uh, then we had all the, the craziness um, from the Bush administration with respect to detention policy, uh, m much of which continues under, under Obama. Um, and... Uh, you know, you've had you had um, you know the Affordable Care Act, which uh, you know I'm, I'm a critic of the the act from the left, right? And that it doesn't doesn't do nearly enough compared to what you know virtually every other civilized country does, uh, and that it doesn't you know really address the the basis for our health health crisis, which is not a health care crisis, it's a health crisis due to the way people eat. But but having said all that, right? The the craziness of the challenges to it that were, you know, dismissed by people knowledgeable about the law, but came within a hair's breadth of persuading the Supreme Court that they were right. Um, so, you know, I, I guess, you know, whatever, I, whatever's happening at any given moment seems to me to be the, the craziest uh, <laughs> thing. So, uh, uh, but, but it, yeah, I mean, it, so I'll just tell you one sort of, uh, uh, revealing anecdote. So a colleague of mine who's, who, who also writes on my blog, a guy named Neil Buchanan, who's a, an economist and a law professor at George Washington University. Mm -hmm. so, so Neil and I wrote a series of articles about the constitutional implications of uh, the debt ceiling business. Um, and nothing, Neil happens to be a vegan also. Uh, I think this is another illustration of this point about how you know, your social circles make a big difference. But this work has nothing to do with that. Um, and so we wrote a, a series of uh, four articles in the Columbia Law Review, um, the most recent of which I think is going to finally be officially published, you know, tomorrow or the next few days. Um, and uh, I was actually kind of a little bit disappointed uh, a few weeks ago when uh, John Boehner announced that, that he was going to temporarily stop the craziness uh, because it meant, you know, um, less craziness to, as, as an inspiration to talk about the constitution for me. Um, <laughs> and so I, 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 I sent an email to Neil, you know, when I saw that, I said, well, on the one hand, this is, I suppose this is good for the global economy. On the other hand, bad for us. Uh, and uh, so as a constitutional law professor, you know, I, I, uh, the good news is that it's always, there's always a crisis going on. Um, uh, you know, the, 
so I, I often have different reactions as a citizen and as a as a scholar or commentator. So, so you must be viewed by your students as that crazy liberal professor that gets everyone uh, thinking about their ideas. Because I know I had them those those professors. So yeah, although you know the thing is, I, I'm I'm actually kind of proud of the fact that I'm I'm well liked by the conservative students as well, um, and, and I think that's because um, I, I take everybody's ideas seriously. So you know, part of being um, on the you know part of the animal rights movement is you realize that that very smart people who can agree with you on all sorts of things will say stupid things about one particular issue. <laughs> and so that you can often find people that you don't expect to agree with on almost anything, but you know, there's often, there's something that they, that they say. So there's, you know, there's a, this conservative legal organization, the Federalist Society that, you know, um, is, you know, responsible for doing a lot to move the country, at least the legal elites to the right. Um, and they have student chapters at all the different law schools. I'm actually very friendly with all the students who are leaders in that organization, I think because they recognize that I, I take them seriously. And I think part of the reason I take them seriously is that I'm, I'm used to having to defend like all of my ideas um, from talking about animal rights issues, right? That is, uh, so if, some, if one of them is saying, you know, well, there shouldn't be any government or everyone should be able to carry a submachine gun anywhere he goes, <laughs> right? Um, somebody who's who doesn't have the experience of having his views marginalized in some other issue would say, "Well, that's just crazy." But I I don't like to dismiss people's ideas as just crazy because I don't like to have my own ideas dismissed as just crazy. <laughs> that's really um, awesome. I, I will say though that yeah that it, that it is. Um, it, I have become more out as a vegan for my students over the years, uh, and that's been kind of fun. I, I'm the uh, so, so here's a sort of silly fact about my, myself. The, uh, a few years ago, a bunch of students at the law school decided that they would have a fundraiser by having a faculty pie eating contest. Um, and the first year they did it, I, I, I wasn't around, so I didn't participate. But the second year they asked me, do you want to do it? So I said, well, you'll have to get me a, a vegan pie. So one of my students baked me a vegan pie. Uh, and the way a pie eating contest works is uh, you have to have, you can't use your hands. So you eat a pie with your face. It's whoever, <laughs> they, they weigh the pie before and after and whoever has eaten the most pie wins. So the first year I did it, I won. Um, I was very proud of myself. But then of course people started saying, oh, we, you, you were cheating. It was the vegan pie. Um, and so I, my, so what, you think it was more delicious? That's great, you know? Uh, so they, they did it. They had this contest again last year and they baked vegan pies for everybody. Awesome. Uh, so that was awesome. And I won again. Um, and uh, the, you know, the, so some, some people asked me what my secret was. Um, and so, you know, of course, they said, well, the other people couldn't eat the vegan pie because it was, you know, it wasn't. I said, well, they lost when it was the non vegan pie too. Uh, and, and the answer was, you know, I, I actually, as a vegan, I, I, I really like to eat. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, you, it, it's, it, the two aren't inconsistent. <laughs> so so uh, that, I will say that after, after you eat an entire pie with just your face, you, you don't really want to eat again for <laughs> a, at least a few hours. <laughs> so uh, being from Cornell, you have the Cornell Vegan Society. Um, and there's something called the Ivy Vegan Conference that was just happened recently. Uh, could you tell us about yeah, that? A so, the a group of students at various Ivy League colleges and universities organized something called the Ivy League Vegan Conference, which I actually thought was a, a, a dumb idea. It, not not a, I think it was a great idea to have a, a conference for uh, uh, vegan, you know, uh, college or university clubs. Mm -hmm. But I, I didn't see any reason why they should have limited it to Ivy League schools. I mean, we're a relatively small group to begin with. I would have had something like the, you know, the intercollegiate vegan conference or something. Um, but they did have, they, you know, they had a bunch of really nice uh, uh, events and speakers. And so that was that was a lot of fun. Um, and uh, I gave a little presentation about uh, the the relation between uh, social change and legal change, which uh, a little bit like what we were talking about earlier about how um, the law comes legal change typically comes after social and, and attitudinal change. Uh, and they had and they had a bunch of good speakers on nutrition and on uh, they actually had the I, I missed the first day of the conference because I, I was still here and 
teaching and my kids were in school. Um, but the first day was all about like vegan entrepreneurship and, you know, people starting businesses and so forth. Uh, so, so it was a, it was a really, really nice thing. I got to meet a bunch of people, uh, some old friends, made some new friends. So I, I thought it was really great. And the students organized it, did a great job. I just wish they would expand it for the next time they do this. I think anytime people can get together like that, it's, it's always great. Um, we're, we're a small enough minority as it is, like you said, so it, it's, it's always good. Um, one of the one of the interesting things I found out when we were getting ready for this was your Wikipedia page says you're into juggling. <laughs> yeah, but, so that page is a little outdated. Um, <laughs> I think one of my students put that up about you know four or five years ago, or even longer, and then they they did it. they uh, um, didn't bother to amend it. Uh, I I do like to juggle. Oh, can... yeah, you can take that real quick. Hello. Oh, great. Hold on. You hold on for one second. Hi, can, yep. I, can I just uh, hold on? I got my, my veterinarian called. Hi, sorry about that. No, no, no problem at all. So is uh, everything OK? Well, so um, it's pretty much what I expected. He does have a there was you know a lot of bacteria in it. So uh, he's he's probably just got a, a, a UTI. And uh, th this happened when in, back in December, too. And they thought he had something called diabetes insipidus, which is a disease I had never heard of, but apparently it means that kidneys can't concentrate their urine sufficiently well. There, there's treatment for it if it turns out that's it, but um, I, I don't think that's what he has. So here we are. So you were telling us about juggling. You're yeah, you are telling us about juggling. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, right. So uh, uh, I guess I must have juggled for my students at some point. So, uh, you know, I, I just learned to juggle when I was a college student. and. Uh, so they, they put that on the on the Wikipedia page. Um, at one point, they said that I think it said that I enjoyed uh, juggling veganism, and then there was some other third thing pie which didn't make sense. Oh, pie, right? But uh, <laughs> uh, I, I told them, well, I don't, th I, I wouldn't put juggling in the same category as veganism because juggling isn't an ethical commitment. Uh, I was going to make a note on your Wikipedia saying citation needed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Exactly. But right. I'm not actually that good at juggling. I mean, I can juggle, you know, bean bags. I can juggle. Uh, I used to be able to juggle pins reasonably well, but I haven't. Uh, the last time I tried that, um, which was over the summer, I, I, you know, I could juggle them for about ten seconds before they started flying all over the place. So, so it's really kind of misleading. I'm, unlike everything else on Wikipedia, which is 100 percent accurate. <laughs> <laughs> what's what's the what's the largest number of items you can juggle? Uh, I can do four, but really, I mean, you know, th uh, even numbers are actually harder than odd numbers. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so I, I've never really gone beyond three comfortably. Uh, so again, you know, just it's, it's grossly misleading. to call me uh, I'm pretty strong with two. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. Two, two, one is, one is really excellent also. <laughs> yeah. It's one of those things I've never been able to do. I've tried a handful of times through my life. I've never been able to stick with it long enough to uh, get it down at all, not even once. Yeah, well, you know, it's it's not really a moral failing. There are a lot of <laughs> things I feel like. Uh, uh, I, I tried to learn to play the guitar for a while because I had a. I, I actually so this is a neither here nor there. But when I first started teaching, one of the things that I, I went to a, a, a conference for new law teachers, and one of the people there said that um, one of the things that happens as you Get it as you advance in your career is you forget what it's like to be a student, um, and one way to combat that is to take classes uh, periodically. So I try to do that. Uh, hmm. So uh, I took an acting class uh, some years ago, which was really fun. Uh, I, I, I said I took a bunch of guitar lessons. Um, I'm not sure what the next thing will be, but it really is true that uh, you know it's easy to to forget what it's like to be a student. Uh, I had an epiphany when I was taking my acting class one day, which was I was, uh, at some point during the class, I, I realized I'd been zoning out for like the last minute and I had no idea what the teacher was talking about. And it, I realized, oh, this must happen to my students all the time. <laughs> uh, that, that's why it's important to repeat stuff. I probably shouldn't admit this to a professor, but I took an entire class one time and only watched movies the entire time. <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, it's, uh, I figure people are people are, are adults. They're paying. If that's what they want to do. That's fine. 
<laughs> I, I was not an adult at that time. I'll be honest. I see. <laughs> <laughs> I've I've learned a lot since those days. Mm -hmm. Um, so how can people get a, a hold of you or, or in touch with you online? Sure. So um, my uh, my blog is dwarfonlaw dot org. Uh, if you just Google Dwarf on Law, um, that's uh, that's my blog. And um, uh, my email is mikedorf at gmail dot com. Um, you know, I have a I, I blog. The, the blog is basically me, uh, my wife Sherry, and uh, Neil Buchanan, who I mentioned. All, as I said, all three of us are vegans, uh, although. Uh, Sherry blogs the most about vegan related topics uh, and animal rights related topics. She had a, she had a really nice uh, couple of posts on uh, the killing of the Danish, the, the giraffe in the Danish uh, zoo um, uh, last week. Um, and um, there are a few other people who sometimes blog for me. And, uh, you know, or you can just go to my, my, my home page at Cornell and you know, up there. Awesome. Well, thank you very much. It's been a lot of fun. Oh yeah, this is great. Thanks, uh, thanks for booking me, and uh, and try to try to stay out of jail. <laughs> <laughs> Appreciate it. But no, it, no you, promises you on that. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. Yeah, thank you. A good one. Bye bye. Good to talk to you. Guys. Bye bye. Today you heard FC Kahana Glitterball, and right now you're listening to Red Nose District T42. And as always, El Comandantes. Which side are you on? Boys, which side are you on? Please go to iTunes and rate and review us. It uh, helps us give us new listeners. Um, if you are on a public computer and you notice someone's already signed on, just do a, a, a ghost subscribe for us. That way they'll start getting our podcast for free. That'd be nice. They'd like it, I bet. I bet that you would. So if you, uh, if you see somebody logged in, a friend logged on to a computer, and uh, just hit subscribe. Yeah. If you have to make up a name, do that too. Yeah. Let's get our ghost subscriptions up. Also, if you are on any social media network, follow us on the tweets. Follow us on the tweet, whichsidepodcast.com slash social. Also, if you see anybody logged in, be sure to follow us on their account as well. Yeah. Might as well. Ghost follows. Yeah. Uh, Facebook as well. If you see someone logged in on Facebook, uh, just go like our shit and... Uh, See how many ghost likes we can get. Ghost likes and ghost follows. I like that. And uh, as always, you can purchase products on Amazon.com using our link at whichsidepodcast.com. God, I feel like such an ass always promoting Amazon. Yeah. Well, if you see anybody with their computer open on Amazon, <laughs> <laughs> be, sure, be sure to purchase products from our website. From our website. Through their Amazon. Through their Amazon. Cool. Ghost purchases. <laughs> I'm down. Ghost everything. Ghost everything. Let's ghost the shit up. You can get us some ghost wish list items as well. Since uh, we didn't have our guests say fuck shit damn this week, I guess it's all on us. Mm -hmm. I didn't even feel like approaching it. I didn't either. He probably would have. Yeah. Reluctantly. <laughs> He'd be like, what? What? I, we might be able to get... Did we even swear on this one? I don't think so. Well, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> shit. shit. Dang him. Which Side is produced by the Which Side Media Collective. Uh -huh.